A California man is the focus of international attention this morning. Newsweek reports that he is the mastermind behind Bitcoin. The digital money is now accepted by merchants all around the world, but the creator has been a mystery. The year was 2014, and the world was guessing who is the mysterious founder behind the fastest growing cryptocurrency in the world, Bitcoin. I'm not in Bitcoin. But you're, you're dressed I'm not in, in Bitcoin. I don't know anything about it. It seemed like his identity was shrouded in mystery. There was no information, no photos, only a name. Satoshi. Satoshi. Satoshi Nakamoto. What Satoshi created was an incredible innovation. It's an all-time high and it's continuing to rise. A sign that people are tired of the banking system and don't trust governments anymore. Bitcoin was an attempt to break free and escape the matrix. Vitalik was a quiet yet gifted kid. His unique abilities made him stand out among his peers. He was naturally predisposed to math and programming and could add three-digit numbers in his head twice as fast as the average person his age. However, he was a stranger to parties and social events, so making new friends wasn't really his thing. People always talked about him like he was some math genius. So he spends most of his days in his room, quenching his thirst for knowledge, absorbing information and making knowledge his primary goal in life. Apart from his love for learning, he had a passion for gaming, especially World of Warcraft, which he played for three years in a row. For him, it was much easier to interact with other people that way, through the virtual world. It was until one day that it all came crashing down, when Blizzard, the company that developed World of Warcraft, decided to remove the damage component from his favorite Warlock Siphon life skill. Basically, the developers just came in and removed his equipment and weapons, which he had collected for a long time. He was devastated and sobbed himself to sleep that night. Vitalik realized how horrible centralized services could be and that he doesn't really have ownership over anything, even if he earned it with hard work and it took years to achieve. The real owner can take it away at any moment and there is nothing he could do about it. Frustrated, Vitalik soon decided to quit his beloved game. While browsing the internet in search of a new passion, Vitalik discovers Bitcoin, at that time worth only $5 and serving as amusement for a few hobbyists who were making transactions between them. If you really, really want to become wealthy in the future, I'm hoping that every single one of you buy some Bitcoins, put it in a goddamn wallet. By that time, the only real-world transaction with Bitcoin for something tangible was 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas from Papa John's. I just told people I wanted a pizza and I want to pay with Bitcoin. I didn't want a gift card, I didn't want some weird exchange. I want to give you Bitcoin and you give me pizza. A user from England took him up on the offer, and these pizzas were delivered to Hanyat's home. At the time, the 10,000 Bitcoins were worth about $40. Which would be roughly $200 million today. At first, Vitalik was skeptical about Bitcoin, since he didn't see how it could have any value if it didn't have any physical backing. But as time passed, he learned more, and his interest grew. Finally, he decided to join this experimental economy as an early adopter and get some tokens. And because he didn't have money to buy them, he decided to mine them. But right away, he encountered a problem. His PC was good for running World of Warcraft, but not for mining Bitcoin. So Vitalik decides to search for work paid in Bitcoin. And after long hours of browsing on forums, he eventually finds himself writing articles for a blog, earning only 5 Bitcoin per article, very modest money at the time. However, it didn't take a long time until Mihai Elisi, a Romanian crypto enthusiast, noticed Vitalik's articles, and very soon, together they founded Bitcoin Magazine. Vitalik took on the role of head writer and spent every free minute working on Bitcoin Magazine while attending university. In no time, Bitcoin Magazine became known as the first serious publication dedicated to cryptocurrencies. Vitalik started getting invited to worldwide meetings and seminars, and he even left university because of it. It seemed that his efforts were paying off, but he felt like something was still off. Even though he was passionate about Bitcoin and the idea behind it, the more he learned about it, the more he realized that the technology was far from ideal. Bitcoin should already be zero by now. You know why it's not? Because it's being manipulated. 
There is no future for the crypto. For example, Vitalik understood that Bitcoin is not so smart. Bitcoin is like a simple tool that can do basic things, mainly sending and receiving money. It doesn't really have much capability to do more than that. For example, it can do complex tasks, like running programs or building apps directly on the Bitcoin network. Making significant improvements or adding new features to Bitcoin is not easy either, as it requires getting agreement from many people involved in the Bitcoin community, which can be a slow and difficult process. As more people use Bitcoin, it can struggle to handle a large number of transactions quickly. This means it might take longer for transactions to be confirmed or processed. Bitcoin is mainly designed to be a digital currency, like online money. You can't do much with it, especially more complicated stuff, like creating complex financial systems or running applications. Vitalik recognized the potential of blockchain technology, but in his opinion, it wasn't versatile. It was too simple and impractical. So he came up with his own, improved idea. Buterin first described Ethereum in a white paper. Essentially, Ethereum was created to be more than just a digital currency, like Bitcoin. It was a decentralized platform that allowed other people to build and run applications without any interference from a central authority. The main difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin was in their technology. While Bitcoin focused on being a digital currency and a store of value, Ethereum went a step further by providing a platform for decentralized applications. In early 2014, Buterin brought the concept of the blockchain project into the public eye at a Bitcoin conference in Miami, Florida, and instantly it was a huge success. The project raised capital via an ICO later the same year, selling over $18 million worth of Ethereum, paid for in Bitcoin. In a short period of time, everyone went crazy about Ethereum, and its currency, Ether, became the second largest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. But soon, Vitalik, along with all of the Ethereum community, is going to experience the hardest hit in its history. In April 2016, a group of Ethereum users created a decentralized autonomous organization, or short, DAO, which was basically a management structure powered by Ether. DAO members were supposed to vote on future Ethereum-related projects. The DAO raised more than $160 million worth of Ether from about 11,000 investors, making it the most successful crowdfunding project ever. Ethereum reached a new all-time high of $22, making the crypto in the DAO worth $250 million. But on the morning of June 17th, while on his way to work, a member of the DAO community noticed that something weird was happening. It looked like funds were being drained from the DAO. By the time the attack stopped a few hours later, 31% of the Ethereum in the DAO has been siphoned out into the Dark DAO. The problem was that the DAO code was not perfect, and someone noticed this. Before anyone could do anything with the DAO, an anonymous user found a vulnerability in the DAO's code and siphoned 3.6 million Ether from the fund, equivalent to $60 million. So it is a hack. Yes, um, but this is this is terrible. Yes. In a matter of hours after the hack, Ether's value plummeted from a high of twenty-eight dollars to eighteen dollars. It has since dropped further to fourteen dollars. But it didn't stop there. Once the security flaw became public, it was just a question of time before another hacker or a criminal group would use the same vulnerability to withdraw the remaining 7.3 million Ether from the DAO. For Vitalik, this only meant one thing. His creation and his reputation were in grave danger of being destroyed, right in front of his eyes. To prevent it, he had to act quickly, and so he did. With the support of the majority of the community, Vitalik decided to turn back time and do a hard fork. The authors of the DAO, they're, they're powerless. So the, the question is whether the community will do anything about it. It's really the clash is whether they uh -uh. agree or disagree with the ramifications of the contract, which is to say, giving the attacker this money. Yeah, probably they'll disagree. Essentially, this led to the hacker losing access to the stolen Ether because the transactions he made to steal the funds were reversed. The hard fork basically turned back the clock on the blockchain, so time before the theft took place. This meant that the hacker's actions were undone and the stolen ether was returned to its original owners. To put it more simply, imagine you're playing a game and you make a move that gives you an advantage. But later, it's discovered that the move was against the rules. In order to make things fair again, the game is reset to a point before your move and you lose the advantage you gained.
Similarly, the hard fork acted as a reset for the Ethereum blockchain, reversing the hacker's transactions and making their actions null and void. As a result, the stolen Ether went back to the rightful owners, and the hacker couldn't benefit from their theft. But despite the fact that the community made the decision to perform the hard fork together, there were users who opposed it. The reason being that they believed blockchains should be unchangeable and decentralized, and a hard fork would violate those principles, which were always at the core of blockchain. So the opponents decided to stay on the original Ethereum blockchain, where the theft took place and the thief still holds the stolen funds. Despite the scale of the crime, no one has been held responsible for the DAO hack as of today, despite the fact that most of the traces lead to a single person. Toby Hannes, ladies and gentlemen! Toby is an Austrian entrepreneur and co-founder of Tenax, a company that raised $80 million for an ICO in 2017. In that period, Toby was living in Singapore and actively taking part in the cryptocurrency boom. Even if there is little to no information about his life during that period, what we do know is that Toby was really invested into Ethereum. A few weeks before the hack, Toby Honish had tried to warn the DAO creators about vulnerabilities in the code, but no one seemed to pay attention to his words. He may have decided to prove them wrong. With what certainty are you that the person that you've identified is the DAO hacker? The evidence is extremely good. The people who were working with me on this, they do a lot of investigations and they said to me, the evidence is never this good. However, Toby never once admitted his guilt and there is still no 100% certain information about who was behind the DAO hack. As of today, Ethereum remains the second largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization, following Bitcoin. Decentralization and neutrality remain two of the core principles of Ethereum, and its founder, Vitalik Buterin, is one of the brightest minds in history. 